For learning outcome number five, module four, we're going to be talking about bone development. Remember when we learned about calcification, where calcification is the process of deposition, crystallization, and the eventual hardening of mineral salts in this framework that is formed by collagen fibers of the extracellular matrix. Now we will be learning about the next major process that occurs in bone tissue, and this is ossification, which is a process by which bone is formed. It can also be called osteogenesis, where osteo is bone and genesis is formation or development, therefore the formation of new bone. And when does ossification occur? There are four principal situations in which this process occurs. Of course, the first situation is during the initial formation of bones in an embryo and fetus. In the second instance, during the development of a newborn into adult, the bone needs to grow, so this will be the second situation. The third occurs during the remodeling of bone, which has to do with the replacement of old bone by new bone. Since during your lifespan, old bone needs to be replaced by new bone tissue, and the last situation is during the repair of fractures throughout life. In other words, in situations if your bones ever break and needs to be repaired. Hopefully this will not happen, but you never know. I actually just broke my first bone in my body this past fall. And so, again, you never know when it's going to happen. But the good thing is that we have this process that's able to repair in case that it does happen. Let's first consider the initial formation of bone in an embryo and fetus. The embryonic skeleton is at first composed of mesenchyme in the general shape of bones. Remember how mesenchyme is the connective tissue that will give rise to most other connective tissues. Therefore, these mesenchyme structures will be replaced by cartilage tissue that will then be replaced by bone and this is when ossification occurs, when you have the final bone product. This process begins during the sixth week of embryonic development and will follow one of the two patterns, either intramembranous ossification or endochondral ossification. Now, it is important to be aware that even though these are two distinct processes, the outcome will be the same and the start of the process will be the same. In other words, both intramembranous ossification and endochondral ossification, they will involve the replacement of an existing connective tissue with bone. In intramembranous ossification, where intra means within and membrane means membrane, bone will form directly within this condensed or aggregated mesenchyme which is going to be arranged in this sheet-like layers that resemble membranes. That's why it's called intramembranous ossification. And the second type, which is the endochondral ossification, where endo also means within and chondro means cartilage, the bones will form within the hyaline cartilage that develops from mesenchyme. So again, both will develop from this mesenchymal connective tissue and the final product will be the formation of a bone. The process of intramembranous ossification is the simpler of the two methods of bone formation. Therefore, let's start with the easiest process. The bones that will use this process are the flat bones of the skull, most of the facial bones, the mandible, which is your lower jaw, and the medial part of the clavicle, which is your collarbone. Also, the soft spots that help the fetal skull pass through the birth canal will later harden by undergoing intramembranous ossification. Therefore, all of the remaining bones are going to be formed by endochondral ossification. So here are the steps of intramembranous ossification. The final product is going to be a spongy bone in the middle formed by two layers of compact bone on the outside, as we can see over here on this final product. First, we're going to have the mesenchymal cells that are in the connective embryonic tissue that will differentiate into osteoprogenitor cells. Remember how the osteoprogenitor cells are the stem cells that give rise to the osteoblasts? And what do the osteoblasts do? 
Well, they are going to secrete the organic extracellular matrix of the bone until they're going to be surrounded by it. And what will happen once the osteoblast starts secreting these components of the extracellular matrix? Well, this material will start to crystallize and starts to harden. And we know already what happens to the osteoblast, right? Well, they're going to get trapped inside of the hard extracellular matrix, more specifically in these compartments that are called lacunae, and they will mature into osteocytes. This developing bone will grow outward from the center of ossification. And although the osteoblasts are still being trapped in the expanding bone, mesenchymal cells will continue to divide and differentiate into osteoblasts that will continue to form these trabeculae. The greater the number of osteoblasts, the more trabeculae is formed. And these trabeculae eventually will fuse to form the spongy bone. And it makes sense, right? Remember that spongy bone is made by these structures that are called trabecula. The cells within the spaces of the spongy bone, they're going to specialize to form the red bone marrow. And in addition to that, the mesenchymal cells that are surrounding this developing bone will specialize to form the periosteum. So around the spongy bone that's being formed, we're going to have the formation of periosteum, which is the membrane that surrounds the bone. And in this periosteum, we're going to have osteoblasts that are going to be the ones that will lay down the bone matrix to form an outer surface of compact bone. And therefore, you're going to have two compact bone sheets on the extremities that are going to be surrounding an inner spongy bone. And this is your intramembranous ossification. So on this figure, this is exactly what we see. We see a cross section of a flat bone that shows spongy bone that's going to be in the middle, lined on either side by a layer of compact bone. And this compact bone is going to be surrounded by periosteum. Moving on to endochondral ossification, we know that most of the bones of the body are formed by this process, but it's best observed in long bones. There are about six to seven steps. It, de it depends on how they break down the steps, but at the end, all these steps will occur during endochondral ossification. So I'm not really concerned about how many steps there are. I just want you to understand the process of bone formation through endochondral ossification. Here I do have listed seven steps and these are the main events that occur at each of these steps, but we will talk about them in more details in the next few slides. The first step is going to start with the mesenchymal cells that will concentrate in a place that will form the future bone. And these mesenchymal cells, they will differentiate into these osteochondral progenitor cells. Remember how on the intramembranous ossification, they differentiated into osteoprogenitor cells that would give rise directly to bones. But because this is endochondral ossification, they will differentiate first into these osteochondral progenitor cells. And the osteochondral progenitor cells, they will give rise to the chondral blasts, which are the ones that will start to deposit the matrix that will form the hyaline cartilage model, which is this model that we see right over here on the right, that's going to be surrounded by a membrane that's called the perichondrium. So the perichondrium will surround this entire hyaline cartilage model. The chondrocytes that are present near the center of the diaphysis, they will start to increase in size. As you can see right over here, these are going to be larger chondrocytes. And then eventually they will start to disintegrate because this matrix over here is going to start to calcify so the cells within the diaphysis over here will not be able to receive their nutrients and therefore they're going to die. And once they die, they're going to form these cavities over here. 
there's going to be spaces that are left by these disintegrating chondrocytes. In step two, what's going to happen is the cells that form the perichondrium over here, which is this membrane that's surrounding the hyaline cartilage model, they will differentiate into osteoblasts. Once they differentiate into osteoblasts, the perichondrium now is called periosteum. And therefore, these osteoblasts, they're going to start to deposit bone right around the diaphysis over here, forming what we call this bone collar that goes around the diaphysis of the bone. And therefore, this is the initial formation of a thin compact bone around the diaphysis or the shaft of the cartilage. Now notice how this bone collar is only located over here in the diaphysis. It's not located on the extremities of this cartilage model. In step three, the main event is the formation of this primary ossification center. And why is it called the primary ossification center? Well, you can see right over here that the blood vessels that started to surround this cartilage model now is able to enter into the diaphysis of this cartilage model and spread out. And also you're going to have osteoblasts that are going to enter as well. And they're going to start to populate the middle section of the diaphysis of the bone and start to deposit matrix. So the cartilaginous matrix is now going to be replaced by the spongy bone that's going to be produced by the osteoblast, by the invading osteoblast. And therefore, it's going to form what we call a primary ossification center. And this primary ossification center, it enters or it starts its development right over here in the middle, and then it will spread out to the epiphysis. Step four sometimes is combined with step three because basically what's happening here is that this primary ossification center is increasing in size and therefore you're going to have the creation of this medullary cavity by the osteoclasts that are now chewing up the bone and resorbing it to model this cavity inside of the bone. So the osteoclasts are going to start to model the medullary cavity. And this will increase the size of the shaft and it will also have osteoblasts that will start to invade the center layer, which is the metaphysis, producing these column-like structures right over here. So we can see right over here that you're going to have the invasion of osteoblasts going into this next layer that's called the metaphysis. And this will cause two things, the increase in the length of this model and also the diameter of this model will also start to increase. In step five, the main event that occurs is the formation of the secondary ossification center that's present in the epiphysis of the long bones. And what will occur in this secondary ossification center is that you're gonna have invasion of more blood vessels on the epiphysis and also the invasion of new osteoblasts that are coming in here and they're going to start deposit the bone matrix in this area and form the ossification center. This timeline for the formation of the secondary ossification center, it will vary from bone to bone, but it will be present at birth on the following long bones, which are the femur, the tibia, and the humerus. In step six, what will happen are two processes. You can see how the spongy bone is going to start to invade the epiphysis, and also there's going to be the formation of this epiphyseal cartilage which can also be called epiphyseal plate. And this epiphyseal cartilage is going to be located between the epiphysis and the diaphysis. The other thing that's going to occur is that the osteoblasts are going to start to invade this epiphyseal cartilage on this diaphysis side or the shaft side at the same rate that the epiphyseal plate 
starts to increase. So it's basically moving the bone up in this direction because the osteoblasts are coming in this direction and the epiphyseal cartilage is getting bigger. So this is what will cause the bone growth. We will cover in more details how this bone growth in length occurs in a different learning outcome. But for now, this is all that you need to know of what happens during this step six. In step seven, basically what's going to happen is that the bone will stop growing. Once the bone reaches its maturity state, it will start to occur two things. The first thing that will happen is that the rate of the enlargement of the epiphyseal plate or epiphyseal cartilage, it will decrease. So there's going to be a decrease in the rate of the epiphyseal cartilage that was in this location on the previous slide. And also there's going to be an increase in the rate of the osteoblast activity, which its function is to deposit bone matrix. So you're gonna have more formation of bone matrix, so more spongy bone, and this epiphyseal plate will now be transformed into what we call the epiphyseal line, which you can see forms like a thick line right between the epiphysis and the diaphysis. In addition, on the extremities, we're going to have the formation of this articular cartilage which is going to be important to protect the bone where you're going to have friction between two bones at a joint. So the articular cartilage is what will protect both ends of the bone. So these are your steps for endochondral ossification, where the end result will be this mature bone.